I invite you to open your Bibles again to the book of Proverbs, which is where we've been for a while. In the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, just as a way of promotion, next week I'm going to start a new series, again from Proverbs. I spent the better part of a year reading and studying the book of Proverbs and making notes and thinking and praying. And so um, the next series from Proverbs is going to be the seven deadly sins. Now, if you want to know about those seven deadly sins, there's a little graphic in your in your handout today, there's lust, envy, wrath, pride, sloth, greed, and gluttony. In other words, we're going to be hitting down where it gets kind of personal. Great wisdom from the Word of God. Someone said, why in the world do you want to emphasize the negative? Uh, you know, my response to that is sometimes in looking at the negative, we can, we can mine nuggets, gold nuggets of the positive in a way that you can't if you're always trying to be positive about everything. So historically, these are called the seven deadly sins. Actuality in the book of Proverbs, you can lay out about 14 such sins. But these are the traditional seven deadly sins. We'll start that on next Sunday. But today we're in Proverbs, the third chapter. And this is a verse you probably have heard before, and you may even have, have memorized it. If it's not noted in your Bible, you ought to note it in your Bible. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Trust in the Lord. This little gem of wisdom in some sense sums up all that we have been talking about in previous weeks where we've been talking about the journey to where we want to be. And I've presented to you what I'm calling the laws of the journey. The first law of the journey is that it's direction, not good intentions, that determines your destination, where you end up. You can have all the good intentions in the world, but if you're on the wrong road, you're going to end up where you don't want to be. And that's just a simple, common sense truth, but it is taught to us in the book of Proverbs. That direction, not intention. No matter how hard you pray about it, if you're on the wrong road, you're going to end up where you don't want to be. You've got to be on the right road. That's law number one. Law number two is that God has a path for you. We talked about the yellow brick road. It would be neat if God would go out there and lay brick and paint it yellow and say, this is your path, just, just follow it, you and your little dog Toto. But it doesn't quite work that way. God does have a path for you, but the Bible describes it as having a narrow gate and describes it as a narrow road and doesn't promise that it's an easy road. But he does have a path for you. Law number three is God will guide you down the paths of his righteousness. His guidance, however, is sometimes counterintuitive. His guidance is sometimes and often it is subtle. And we've talked about four things that if you're not doing these four things, how can you be certain you're on the road to where you want to be with the Lord? These four things are take a moment every day and just make sure you focus on God. You're conscious, aware of Him. Number two, take a moment every day to read from His Word. Develop a plan. There are great plans out there that you can find that carry you through reading the Word of God. It's usually not one reading that changes your life. Sometimes it does. But really it's the cumulative effect of reading the Word of God and we learn how to hear God speak through his word from reading it. So number three, take a, just a few moments every day to pray. And naturally we pray for ourselves and our own interests and there's nothing wrong with that. But get beyond that. Go beyond that and pray for others. And go beyond that and pray for the kingdom of God. That his will is done and all of his kingdom. And then number four. Seek every day in some way how you can serve or help somebody else in his name. 
Seek that every day in some way. It doesn't have to be anything big or dramatic, something small. But I promise you, if you make those four habits a daily part of your life, then you're going to more likely know the path He has for you. And you're going to be going down that path that He has for you. So the third law is God will guide you on the path of His righteousness. The fourth law is if you get off track, if you get lost, if you get distracted, you don't get back by fixing problems. There may be problems that needed fixing, but you get back on the right path by changing directions. You have to change. Go back to where you got off the path and get back on the path. It takes a radical thing to change when we've gotten off the path to where he wants to be. Law number five, it is attention. That that you, what you pay attention to that influences direction. The body naturally gravitates toward what the eye is seeing, what the ear is hearing, what the mind is focused on. Whatever has your attention, that's what you're moving toward. And attention is how you leverage the future. It's about the only influence you, influence you have over the future. It's not an accident that you'll see families where generation after generation there's, there are doctors or people in the medical field. You'll go back and somewhere in that family history there's somebody who gave their attention to medicine. And it influenced the direction of the family for generations to come. The same is true of faith. In my family, there are generations of ministers and deacons and so forth and so on. Somewhere back there, my grandfather in Macomb, Mississippi, may gave his attention to faith and serving Christ and serving his church. And it has influenced generations after generation. The joke in my family, because there are so many preachers, is that when God God's ready to call the next one. He just says next. And you step up. It is attention that affects direction. And what you give your attention to is about the only way you have of leverage, leveraging the future. What the future is going to be for you and for others. Law number six. There are hard and difficult dangers on the road, but you can anticipate them and react wisely. And how do we do that? Well, we do a couple of things. We learn to listen to the wisdom of the aged, those that have gone before us, and the wisdom of the ages, those who have written and accounts such as the Word of God, especially the Word of God, that gives us wisdom. We learn how to connect the dots. How if you engage in certain behaviors, it leads to certain outcomes. And if you're wise and you're looking ahead and you're listening to the wisdom of the aged and the wisdom of the ages, you can see those dangers before you get there and you can avoid them. You can work your way around them. And today we come to the seventh law, the last in this series. And it kind of sums everything up. And the seventh law is simply this, acknowledge Him. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. I've spoken about the wisdom of the ages. What exactly is the wisdom of the ages? Well, we point towards Solomon. Solomon is believed to be the author of the book of Proverbs. Solomon is considered to be the wisest man that ever lived. And indeed, the son of David, at the point when he was going to be crowned as king, in a dream, he prayed and talked to God. And God offered him anything. And what he asked for was wisdom. And God granted him wisdom, but also granted him great power and great wealth. I wish I could say the end of Solomon's life is a great happy success story, because, but it's not. Solomon got distracted. He got off the road to where he wanted to be. But during most of his reign, he was a very wise leader and a very wise king, which leads to this definition of wisdom. What is wisdom? First of all, it's the fear or respect of God, which leads to the ability to make good decisions. 
That is in a nutshell the essence of what wisdom is. You find someone who sings that their life, they have the Midas touch and everything they touch turns to gold. Everything they do seems to work well. And my guess is most of the time you look heavy and deep into that person's life and what you discover is someone who has made wise decisions. They have simply learned how to make good decisions in life. It doesn't mean every decision they made has been great. All of us have bad ones every once in a while. Best decision I ever made was when I asked that lady right there to marry me. And the good part of it was she said yes, and I didn't have to ask twice. <clears throat> it was a good decision. Wisdom is all about the decisions that we make, and God is interested in the decisions that we make. And in the process of being on the journey to where you want to be, the central task is that we acknowledge Him in all of our ways. In all of our ways. Fearing God, respecting God's providence and will and guidance in your life. And then gaining the wisdom of the aged and the ages, the wisdom of the Word of God, and using it, leveraging the future by what your attention is turned upon, and making good decisions. Now let's look a little more about what this is teaching us about this idea of trusting God, acknowledging Him. First of all, it's expressed positively. He says, trust the Lord with all your heart. It is a giving of attention. Attention influences direction. You give attention to Him. And He doesn't say give haphazard attention. He says give total attention. Trust the Lord with all your heart, with all your mind, all your emotion, all your will. Trust the Lord with all your heart. What does this word trust mean? Interesting enough, the origin of this word trust is the word for lying face down on the ground before a ruler or a king. Placing yourself before them down on the ground. Trusting them to not harm you, to not hurt you. And submitting yourself hopelessly and helplessly and with all vulnerability before them. Have any of you ever done that trust exercise where you've got a group of people and then to help develop trust, they'll have you stand there and cross your arms and then just fall backwards. Just, just fall. And you're trusting your coworkers to catch you. And that could be a little tricky in some workplaces. You're trusting that they're going to catch you. If you've ever done that, you really, it sounds real simple, but it is not simple at all. To stand there, cross your arms and close your eyes, and just let yourself go. Let yourself fall back, trusting that you'll be caught. This is the idea being expressed here. Trust God with all your heart. Place yourself before Him in a helpless, vulnerable position where you are utterly relying upon Him and not on anything else. It's taking that leap of faith, jumping out there, even when you can't see what the outcome's going to be. It is total and complete trust. I, great friends with a basketball, one of the most successful basketball coaches in the history of basketball in the state of Mississippi, Norris Ashley. He coached the Ingemar Falcons up in northeast Mississippi for I don't know how many years. Uh, he had a team in 1977 that went 44 and one. They were the smallest. They had four classifications. They were the smallest classification of schools in the state. And back then, the four classifications would all play each other till you had four champions. Then the four champions would play each other for what they called the Grand Slam. The only small school to ever win the Grand Slam was little Ingemar 
coached by Norris Ashley. They beat Gulfport. There was no such thing as a three-point shot. Norris did not have a player over six foot. They did not have a player under six foot. If it had been a three-point shot in that game, it would have been a runaway because those Inglemore boys could shoot it from the cheap seats all day long and just sink them one after another. He instilled upon in them and did this all of his long successful career, this idea of team, of trusting each other, of depending on one another. And he built, he would build this sense of teamwork. He used to tell me, I'm going to get this group of boys united one way or the other. And I'd say, what do you mean, Norris? He said, they're either going to get united as a team to help each other be the best they can be, or they're going to be united hating me, one or the other. He had as many teams that hated him as he did that came together in supporting and encouraging one another. He was successful because he was able to take a group of boys and girls, and in coaching them, they were better than the sum total of their parts. He had no outstanding talents that went on to college ball. But yet, they would play the big schools and would beat them over and over again. They were overachievers. They bought into the concept of team. They bought into the idea of trusting one another with everything. And it was happening on the court, and it also happened off the court in the lives, most of the time, in the lives of those students. Trust God with everything, with all your heart, mind, emotion, and will. Now that's the positive way of saying it. But he also says it negatively. He says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And then he says negatively, but do not Lean in your own understanding. And I know some people think, why do we have to always go negative? Why do we have to say negative things? We know sometimes in stating the negative, we can give more information and set people freer than if we have to say everything positive. Let me give an example. You got a kid and the kid wants to go play in the backyard. You want to make sure they're safe. And so you begin telling them everything they can do. Yes, darling, you can kick the ball. Yes, you can swing on the swing set. Yes, you can slide on the slide. Yes, you can run around the yard. Yes, you can climb the tree. And you just make a long list. What ends up happening is the kid looks at the list of what you've given him permission to do, and that's all he does because there's no imagination involved. Mommy said yes to these things. I can do them. But you'd have to make a long list to cover everything that a child could do out in the backyard that would be okay for them to do. It would be a long list. However, the simpler thing is just tell them what they can't do. Tell them this is the no. Mommy will be mad if you do this. Number one, don't leave the yard. Number two, don't play with the water hose. And number three, don't hit your sister. And that pretty much covers everything. <laughs> But by giving them the negative, what not to do, which is a shorter list, you set their imagination free to now to discover the things they want to do and will be fun and they can enjoy doing without getting in trouble. I remember being put in the backyard to play when I was growing up in West Jackson. Now, I'd gotten in trouble because I was leaving the backyard to go places without asking permission. And because I'd gotten in trouble for that, I was sent to the backyard and told I could not leave the backyard. That was my punishment. I was grounded to the backyard. Well, my friends in the neighborhood came over to play, but they didn't want to stay in my backyard. They wanted to go do other stuff, and they left, and left me alone in the backyard. I didn't have a dog. I didn't have anything. It was just me alone in the backyard. But I did have my G.I. Joes. Now, the kid across the street accused me of playing with dolls, so I punched him in the nose. <clears throat> I had my G.I. Joes, and they weren't the little ones. These were the big ones when they first came out. And I had a G.I. Joe parachute. 
and the strings and the parachute, you could wrap it up and you could throw Joe up in the air. And if you were lucky, the parachute actually inflated and Joe would come floating down. I was throwing him as high as I could. I was climbing up on the swing set and throwing Joe as high as I could get him. And I got him up there and he came down over the fence in the neighbor's yard. My G.I. Joe was out of the yard, and I'd been threatened within an inch of my life if I left the yard. That was the one rule. The one rule was don't leave the backyard. I looked around, and there at the back by the ditch, there was a, before the back fence, there, there were a row of crepe myrtles. There's some long, thin limbs on there. I went and got my dad's clippers, and I was going to clip off one of those limbs. Well, I couldn't make that happen. So I went and I got his saw, a carpenter's saw. You know what I'm talking about? And I started trying to cut that limb. Well, it was about to kill me trying to cut that limb. Now, there's got to be a smaller saw. So I went and got his hacksaw. That was smaller and lighter, and I got that hacksaw, and I got on and got on, and I cut that limb loose, and then I used that limb to reach over the fence into the neighbor's yard and to hook the parachute and get my G.I. Joe back. Now, unfortunately, I left the tools out in the yard. <laughs> And my dad worked on the railroad. When he got back, he was uh, very upset that rust had developed on some of his tools. And my punishment there was to take this jelly stuff and put on there and try to get all the rust off. But on the other hand, he was very pleased with my ingenuity. I stayed in the yard, but I got my G.I. Joe. <clears throat> you see, the negative rule set me free to imagine and to be creative and to think of the things I can do. If you do it the other way, you only tell them what they can do, then they don't ever imagine, they don't ever create, they're never seeking. So in a sense, the negative rules are the most liberating. They're the ones that set us free. He says it in the positive, trust in the Lord. Now he says it in the negative, lean not do not rely, do not prop yourself up on your own understanding. Now notice the contrast here. In the positive, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And by heart, he's speaking of the mind. He's speaking of the emotions. He's speaking of the volition of the will, the heart. But then on the negative, he says, don't lean on your own understanding your own intellectual and reasoning ability. Don't make that all you lean on. This is a rejection of the whole idea of academic arrogance and intellectual pride. That we can, on our own, through our own reasoning, solve all the world's problems and figure everything else out for ourselves. I promise you, everyone in this room, and everyone who's listening to me by the radio, you have in your mind an idea of how you're going to face God one day. You've got it in your mind. You think you've, you've got it figured out. I'm going to face God one day and... I can say I was better than most. Matter of fact, you may have someone specific in mind that you were better than. It makes it really juicy if that someone was a deacon or a preacher or something. <laughs> and you were better than them, thus by comparison, you're going to be okay. You can throw that before God and say, look, my reasoning tells me I was okay compared to. I promise you, you've thought this way. Everyone has at some point or another. However, you're leaning on, you're trusting in your own reasoning ability for the ultimate question of life. I am not courageous enough to trust in my own intellectual reasoning ability for the ultimate questions of life. Instead, I'm going to lean on Him. I'm going to prop myself up on Him. I'm going to lean on what He has taught me, the wisdom of the ages. 
the truth passed down to us from our fathers before us. The truth passed down to us through the Holy Spirit in the Word of God. The wisdom of the age. The wisdom of the ages. I'm going to trust though that reasoning. Not in my own. I'm going to let that reasoning shape. So positively express, trust God with all your heart. Place yourself vulnerable before Him. Negatively express, don't lean or rely on your own way of thinking. And then finally He says, in all your ways, acknowledge Him. What does He mean by ways? Well, ways could mean habits. You know how it is. You've got your way of doing things. What's funny is to watch two men to go to work on something together, and each of them's got a different way of doing it. And you're going to see some negotiations start taking place. And I guess the same thing with women, but I don't pay as much attention to women and that kind of stuff. I kind of get out of the kitchen, let's get out of here. But you begin this negotiation. I'll tell you where that was interesting, was in seminary, in the seminary village, where there were these children from all over the country and all over the world. And children from all different parts of the country, from all over the world, they all of them play kickball, but every one of them plays by a different set of rules. And so you put them out there to play, and some intense negotiations start happening because each one has their way of how to play the game. In all your ways, your habits, your mannerism, ways also refer to a path. A direction. And all your paths, all your directions, acknowledge Him. It's not talking about just a nod. Yeah, God, you're there. Just nod. Rather, it's talking about surrender. Where the officer salutes. The soldier salutes the officer. Recognizing the officer's authority at that situation in that place. Acknowledge, surrender to him, and here's his promise. He will make the best path obvious for you. He's going to direct your path. Divine direction in all areas of life begin with an unconditional submission, not with information. We think it's gathering information that's the key thing, but I would suggest to you the key thing in finding the direction God has for your life, it begins with an unconditional surrender and submission to Him. What happened to Solomon? Solomon asked for and received wisdom. But then somewhere along the line, in an attempt to strengthen foreign relationships, Solomon entered into treaties or relationships with other nations, and to seal those treaties, there were women exchanged. It's a terrible, terrible thing, but that's what was done. And so he developed more and more wives and concubines, each one representing a new relationship with a new foreign entity. It enriched him and enriched the kingdom tremendously. And Israel under Solomon reached its pinnacle of strength, wealth, and influence. But it also opened the door to idolatry in the palace as these foreign women brought their idols with them. Solomon, for all of his wisdom, made the wrong choices in his own personal life. He chose the wrong path. God wants you to choose the right road, the right path. Are you on the right road or are you on the wrong road? In your financial life, and the way you handle the money that God's entrusted you with. Are you on a path toward financial stability and solvency? Or are you on the path to financial ruin? Don't act surprised when you arrive there if that's the path you're on. Because you will arrive there. 
in your relational life, in your key relationships with the key people in your life? What is the path that you're on? Are you on the wrong path? Are you on the path that leads to the continual dissolution of relationships and destructive kinds of behaviors and patterns? Or are you on a path that is strengthening and heightening and making relationships stronger and sweeter and better? In your vocational life, whether you're working or retired, what you do with your time, you do with yourself, what is the path that you're on? Rafi Zacharias says that you want to know a man's true religion or a woman's true religion, look at what they do and think about when they are alone. When you're alone. What is the path that you're on? Are you on the right path or are you on the wrong path? And in your spiritual life, are you on the right path with God? Or are you on the wrong path? If in any of these or other areas of your life you feel like you're on the wrong path, then ask yourself these three questions. Why are you hesitating to give God full access to that part of your life? Why? What's holding you back? Question number two. What is it you're afraid of? What do you fear might happen on the other side of a decision to trust in Him fully and completely? What do you fear? And third, what part of your life is the most difficult part of your life most difficult to yield to Him, to yield to God. The Bible says, trust in the Lord. Don't lean on your own understanding. And He will direct you to the right path, to the journey, on the journey, to where you really want to be. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father, we all come here today because you brought us here. It's not an accident. It's divine providence. And that in this time of worship together, we encounter your presence and your wisdom from your word. I pray that anyone here who realizes an area of their life where they're on the wrong path, they're on the wrong road, that instead of trying to fix problems, they'll realize there needs to be a change of direction. A change. You call for us to repent of our sins, and that's what repentance means. It means to turn around and go the other way, to change directions, moving away from God, turn back toward Him. You call upon us to repent and to confess. And you promise, Lord, we trust in you. You'll make the path clear and straight. In Jesus Christ, you've given us the forgiveness of sins. In Jesus Christ and his resurrection, you give us the hope of eternal life. In Jesus Christ, there is the path the path of your righteousness. Thank you for your gift. In Jesus' name, amen.